Euh, la prochaine conférence sera le premier 10 minutes en français, le second en anglais. Donc, si vous avez besoin de traducteurs, je vous invite à aller vous en munir. Donc, pour la première partie de la présentation, euh, nous aurons euh, comme conférencier M. Denis Caron, qui est directeur des opérations avicoles à la Coop fédérée. Il sera ensuite su suivi par M. Mike Casto, euh, qui est spécialiste technique mondial de la transformation pour l'entreprise COB. Donc, la prochaine présentation s'intitule « Optimiser le rendement dans la filière poulet de chair de la ferme de reproduction à l'abattage ». Je vous invite à applaudir M. Denis Caron. Le cliqueur, euh, Alexandre, il est sur quelque part. Ah, il est là. Merveilleux. Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Ça me fait plaisir de, de prendre la relève un peu dernière minute, mais euh, comme j'étais le parrain de la présentation, mais ça s'est fait quand même assez naturellement. On va essayer de vous donner cette présentation-là. Et donc, euh, ah, c'est vrai que c'est pas la même. Euh, il y a un délai dans les slides, hein, Alex? Là je, là, je comprends, Keith. <rire> Mais c'est pas grave, on va s'adapter. Non, I won't touch yours. <rire> Donc, euh, juste pour votre introduction, euh, Alexandre m'a présenté comme directeur des opérations avicoles à la Coop fédérée. Ça, ça veut dire que sous mon, sous mon ombrelle, si on peut dire, euh, j'ai... Euh, avec Jean-Michel Charbonneau, la direction euh, des fermes de reproduction qui fournissent les œufs euh, à M. Euh, Gilles Lisotte au couvoir euh, de Victoriaville. Puis j'ai aussi dans mon équipe euh, un monsieur euh, que plusieurs connaissent sûrement, euh, Jean Boisjoli, qui est euh, plusieurs années euh, maintenant avec nous, euh, au-dessus de 30 ans, euh, à la direction des fermes de poulet de chair. Donc ça, c'est mon équipe en gros en résumé. Ça fait quatre ans maintenant que je suis à ce poste-là, et avant ça, j'ai été 13 ans à, à la nutrition. C'est ce monsieur ici en avant, Alexandre, notre présentateur, qui a pris la relève quand j'ai pris la direction. Donc, ça me fait plaisir encore une fois d'être avec vous. Donc, on va parler euh, ici d'optimiser le rendement dans la filière poulet de chair. On a vu la première présentation de Monsieur Bramwell, qui est focusé plus sur l'œuf comme tel, qui vous a entretenu sur ce sujet-là. Maintenant, on va aller voir du côté euh, des reproducteurs, donc là, avant ce qui se passe, du côté management, du côté reproduction. Et puis ensuite de ça, on va aller côté abattage. Donc, on va faire complètement un tour euh, de roue avec euh, le produit, comment il est processé euh, au... au au plan d'abattage. Excusez, des fois, euh, la traduction, euh, je passe du français à l'anglais. On va essayer de faire ça comme il faut. Donc, euh, les, au niveau des parentaux, euh, je vais aller dans cinq points euh, euh, plus en détail. Euh, on va les passer un après l'autre. Donc, en premier, l'uniformité des femelles durant l'élevage. Euh, quelques points importants là-dessus. Le développement de l'ossature et de l'étoche chair, on en parle souvent euh, plus que le poids, euh, simplement. Euh, le moment de la stimulation lumineuse, qui est le moment le plus important euh, dans la vie euh, de la poule pour optimiser sa production. Ensuite de ça, rapidement, une alimentation en fonction du pic et pour obtenir le pic maximal euh, pour, euh, en fin de compte, avoir euh, la meilleure qualité de poussin possible. Puis rapidement, sur euh, les poids des œufs euh, comme paramètre de, de vérification. Donc, euh, le but final, c'est sûr que c'est euh, d'avoir des œufs d'incubation de qualité puis des poussins uniformes et en santé. Le, ouais, je vais suivre là, ça va aller mieux. L'uniformité des femelles durant l'élevage. Donc, euh, si on ne fait pas rien, mais naturellement, si vous voulez, on va aller avec une... Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on marque ici? C'est une, une uniformité naturelle de 70 à 75 Tout ce qu'on va faire en régie d'élevage dans les reproducteurs, ça va viser à aller au-dessus de ça. Donc, augmenter cette uniformité-là. Une uniformité constante, ça nous, ça fait en sorte, pourquoi c'est important, c'est que ça nous, ça nous amène que les femelles vont manger toute la même quantité d'aliments le plus possible et que tous prennent du poids de façon égale. Après ça... Euh, aussi, bon, les prochaines slides, on va aller selon les, les semaines d'âge, mais euh, il y a des, des semaines d'âge qui vont être des points importants au long de la vie de la poule, puis euh, ça commence dès l'âge de quatre semaines. 
vous voyez ici, ça, on parle du fameux, euh, ce qu'il appelle en anglais le « grading », qui était bien populaire dans, en Amérique latine, Amérique du Sud, parce qu'il y avait beaucoup de main dœuvre disponible, il était capable de le faire. La ligne bleue, en fait, c'est quand on n'en fait pas euh, du tout, donc sans classement euh, de poules selon le poids. La ligne rouge, c'est euh, un élevage où est-ce qu'on a eu un classement des poules euh, qui commence normalement à quatre semaines. Euh, il y en a un deuxième à huit, puis après ça, un troisième à douze. Et euh, la ligne en noir, c'est un lot qui a eu un problème d'alimentation. Donc, on peut voir l'impact de cette... Euh, cette pratique-là de classement des poules selon le poids, selon aussi le, ce qu'on appelle en anglais le fleshing, l'état de chair des poules. Donc, ça, vous voyez sur cette slide-là des pratiques, euh, des essais en fait qui ont été faits et vous voyez l'impact que ça peut avoir. Donc, l'uniformité de la sature euh, est déterminée en grande partie dans les 12 premières semaines pour con corriger et compenser euh, ce point-là, la croissance des poules. On va grouper les poules euh, ayant un poids entre 98 et 102 du standard à huit semaines, mais euh, ce qu'on veut faire, c'est le faire dès l'âge de quatre semaines pour arriver à avoir un impact euh, à 12, parce qu'après 12 semaines, on a moins euh, de possibilité de le faire. On ne veut pas, en fait, de changement de poids à, à partir de 12 semaines et après. Vous voyez un exemple là, de, de classement de poules. Euh, selon l'état de chair, donc le développement de la poitrine, entre autres, beaucoup sur laquelle on va se baser, puis on va aller voir aussi dans ce classement-là comment est euh, l'état du fat pad, excusez le terme en anglais, mais l'accumulation de graisse euh, intra-abdominale. Donc l'état de chair, pourquoi c'est important de le faire, euh, c'est justement, c'est quand 16 et 20 semaines d'âge, euh, oui, il y a une augmentation du poids corporel qu'on veut des poules, mais on ne veut pas qu'elle soit trop euh, différente de l'augmentation la, standard de poids. On ne veut plus que la poule se développe vraiment dans cette période-là ou qu'elle décroche de la courbe de croissance standard recommandée. On veut qu'elle la suive tout simplement. C'est important de rentrer dans cette période-là euh, déjà dans un bon état de chair. Donc, c'est pour ça que je vous parlais dans la slide précédente de déjà un classement à 4 et 8 semaines où, même si on ne fait pas de classement au Québec, ce n'est pas une pratique euh, normale, bien, c'est au moins de savoir et de travailler le plus possible <coughs> avec les outils qu'on a pour avoir la, la plus haute possible uniformité des troupeaux. Et pourquoi c'est important? Ce qu'on vous parle beaucoup de, de ce point-là, c'est qu'à la stimulation lumineuse, pour avoir euh, ben, les œufs qu'on devrait avoir et une augmentation rapide de production, donc que la poule réponde à la stimulation lumineuse, ben, on se doit d'avoir euh, ces paramètres-là, entre autres, euh, le bon développement musculaire, un bon euh, nossature et euh, la réserve de gras pour être capable que la poule se mette en ponte euh, facilement et qu'elle ait une persistance de ponte par la suite aussi, pas qu'elle se vide, autrement dit, de son énergie, qu'elle ait dans son muscle et dans ses, ses autres organes pour essayer de soutenir la production importante. À la prochaine slide, on voit justement, ça c'est ce qui est marqué, ce qui est le pointeur, ah il est là, c'était pas assez gros. Hein? Ici, c'est une poitrine en fait que, là on les a ouverts pour que ce soit plus évident, mais c'est ça qu'on fait en fait quand on fait le, le classement des poules, qu'on vérifie le développement, c'est que ça, c'est une catégorie. Ce qu'on appelle dans le classement, là, des 1, 2, 3, 4. Bien, ça, c'est une 2. C'est un peu maigre, si vous voulez, puis il n'y a surtout pas euh, de développement euh, de gras, donc de graisse abdominale pour des réserves pour la, le démarrage de la ponte. Alors qu'ici, une classe 3 de, de poitrine, et là, vous avez euh, l'accumulation de graisse que je vous parlais pour que la poule ait des réserves pour la mise en ponte. Donc, euh, comme je vous disais, le, le moment de la stimulation lumineuse, c'est un des moments les plus importants dans la vie de la poule. Trop tôt, ben, ça va créer plein de problèmes comme péritonite, euh, mort subite, etc. Trop tard, ben, là, les femelles vont être trop lourdes. Ça va diminuer le pic de production, la persistance. Puis aussi, euh, c'est que là, on, on va avoir de la misère à contrôler notre poids d'œuf. Parce que le poids d'œuf, ça commence avec le poids de poule. Euh, ça, c'est des choses plus techniques. Donc, euh, pour... Pour une cob fast feather ou une cob slow feather, on recommande certains poids. 
à jeun au moment de la stimulation lumineuse pour que les poules puissent répondre de façon optimale. La lumière, c'est un fort stimulant dans les troupeaux uniformes, donc plus qu'on voit de l'uniformité, plus que les troupeaux vont bien réagir à la stimulation lumineuse. Euh, donc, la stimulation lumineuse, c'est 4 heures. On recommande 4 heures d'un bloc, puis un minimum de 50 lux comme euh, intensité lumineuse. Puis, on peut compléter par la suite avec euh, au maximum à 14 heures, mais on, après ça, on peut donner des heures euh, subséquentes. L'impact euh, rapidement, euh, ça c'est une slide qui démontre, euh, je vais mettre tout de suite l'autre en bas. <coughs> ça montre euh, des poules ici, résumé rapidement, là, trop maigres. Donc des poules un peu en dessous euh, du target qu'on s'était fixé en termes de développement. Puis ici, celles qui sont euh, en bon état de chair. Vous voyez les résultats, la mortalité zéro séjour de la progéniture, donc les poussins qui sont issus de ces poules-là. Vous voyez que pour celles qui ont un peu trop maigre en état de chair, bien, ils, ont, ils montrent une progéniture qui a une plus haute mortalité, zéro séjour, comparativement à, ceux, à celles qui avaient un bon état de chair. Et ensuite, euh, les, bien, le, ça, c'est la valeur maximale, mettons. Donc, 1,3 de moyenne, 2,33 valeur maximale, 0,75, 1,15 de valeur maximale. Puis, euh, pour, juste pour démontrer la prise alimentaire de ces poules-là, donc, trop maigre, vous voyez qu'il y avait une prise alimentaire euh, pratiquement un kilo euh, plus faible. Donc, euh, durant la période de 0 à 26 semaines d'âge, si je ne me trompe pas, pour la période de développement. Puis ça, pour les puristes ou les nutritionnistes qui sont intéressés aux chiffres de calculer, ça vous montre, euh, en fait, les, les ingestions de kilocalories de ces poules-là de 0 à 21 semaines. Puis il y, une, il y a un petit mix dans la slide, dont on la corrigera à, à l'envoi. C'est juste les protéines. Ici, c'est 12,75. Ce chiffre-là, il va là, là. Ensuite de ça, ça montre... Euh, excusez, c'est vraiment pas pareil. Donc, le poids des œufs, euh, le poids des œufs et l'uniformité des œufs. Je vous ai parlé de l'uniformité des poids de poule, mais ça se transmet en uniformité d'œuf. Donc, vous voyez le poids de poule contrôlé, pas plus lourd que 70-71 grammes. Et puis, euh, l'uniformité des œufs, donc, c'est maintenu. Donc, c'est des choses qu'on peut mesurer, euh, pas seulement l'uniformité des poules, mais l'uniformité euh, des poids d'œufs aussi. Ce qu'on veut, justement, c'est un poids entre 58 et 68 grammes, euh, normalement, pas plus. C'est pas vrai que des œufs plus lourds vont nécessairement donner des meilleurs poussins. Euh, souvent, on rentre dans des problèmes, donc, il faut nécessairement le contrôler. On ne peut pas simplement dire, ah, ben. Un œuf gros, c'est un poussin bon, fait que euh, non, c'est pas réel, comme euh, il faut le contrôler, le poids d'œuf. Et là, c'est là que l'endroit que je passe euh, la parole à Mike. You've been talking about me already? Yes. OK, I just want to double check. We don't have much time, so I'll just start out by asking this. Who has responsibility for any of the processing facilities within your company, if you're an integrator or not? Exactly. <laughs> I knew this. The last meeting I had, I had the same show of hands. Okay. The reality of it is everyone in this room, typically, if you drill down, has responsibility for the processing plant. Especially if you're into the hatcheries, the breeders, and we've been leading up to that today, where we've discussed all the way through the breeders, through the hatcheries. Now, just a little bit about the broilers. I'm not a broiler man, I'm not a broiler specialist, but I had practical experience of about 14 years of growing broilers, so I know this much about it, okay? But I think it'll help you out. One of the things that is, well, and you let me die over here, Dennis. I'm a late arrival, so uh, I'm having to uh, use two computers. And I have enough trouble utilizing just one. Okay. 
By the way, I'm from Arkansas, too, if you can't tell it. Everyone in here speaks better English than me, that's for sure. I'm kind of the slang redneck guy. Okay. I'm going to try to match it up. Okay. Imprinting concept of chicks and how they behave. One thing that I, I learned early on, really too late, I should have known it before I started in the business, but is that, that, that basically chicks are illiterate, okay? So you need to imprint them to your setup and your house. Consistency is the key. Make sure that the entire house, your setup, and bringing those chicks in is the way it should be. Air, feed, water. We focus a lot here on the, the, the water, okay, because we believe that uh, to get the bird to get a good start, he needs a drink first. Typically have a lot of dehydration in some cases. So to get the bird to the feed, we want in that first six hours. We want that bird to get a drink, and then we want the bird to get on the feed, okay? So in close proximity, we want to have them both. One thing that I did from a personal perspective is we talk about making sure that those nipples are ready and have been activated. Something that I used to make myself, my wife, and my daughters, we would all go to those eight poultry barns that I had. 24 hours early, I had put peroxide in those water lines. We'd put half the house on flush, we'd line up, and we would manipulate every nipple, every how many million it was in that day. We never failed doing that, and we never had a stopped up nipple, and never had issues with water consumption with baby birds. Let's talk about CUE and uniformity. One of the things from a processor, we would like to have a CV coming to that processing plant of that broiler at an 8 to 12, somewhere in that range. And the reason why we have such a spread is because we can believe with a, a typical setup and setting on a machine that we can handle that range, okay? The problem is, is when you go above and beyond that. If we take a look at this chart on seven days, okay, this is seven day old birds. What we see here is that, uh, that basically the, uh, the uniformity is not real good, you know, uh, independent of the age of the, of the parent sometimes. You see there's a lot of variation in weight and then thus you see the percentages start to drop off. So what we see here is a, a uniformity of a 68% and a CV of 9.8 out of this volume of this, this sampled group here of 436. So at seven days, we already see that it's 9.8 on this sample. What we see on birds that are going right into the house, yes, sir? They are... Yeah, uh, as a uh, straight runs, that is correct. Yes. The parent, uh, I'm sorry, on the, uh, we see a 9.8 on the average at seven days. And, and all of the, and, and you, you ask the question, is it straight runs? Yes, and that's what we, uh, when I talk about birds, the uniformity of 8 to 12 coming to the plant, it's also straight runs, Okay. So what ends up happening is when what we consider a perfect CV on the bird going to the, to the floor at day one is a 7.1 to 7.3, somewhere in that range. So we already know that we, we kind of, we're not very far away even at seven days from that 12, okay? So it takes a, a concerted effort from the time it's hit the ground in the broiler farm all the way to that processing plant. Five key areas, okay? And what we're trying to do is, what I'm trying to do is tie everything in from live production and, and, and make sure that everybody understands we come to the plant together. And the reason why that is is because everything up to the plant door is cost. Once you come through the plant door, it's cost. Once you get to selling the product out the back door, that's when we all get paid, okay? Catching, transport, and live receiving. We're going to tie those together along with the other four 
issues we have here, and, th and these are the processes we have within the plant, okay, once the birds get here. Okay, so we're going to start at the farm. One of the things that we want to do, we want to make sure that we have a good feed withdrawal, okay? We like to say that in our best practices, we, have, we would like to see an 8 to 12 hour window of feed withdrawn from the birds before the slaughter blade, okay? We think that gives us the best clean out and still at 12 hours we have enough gut integrity, we should be okay. Also, we want proper catch methods. Once it arrives at the abattoir, whether it be in an outside holding shed or in a larage, make sure we have plenty of spacing, we have cooling, good transportation, and then good at slaughter practices. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Nothing is more true, especially in this industry. What I'd spoken of a moment ago is the discussions we'll have today are basically, uh, it's about best practices. And with those best practices, we're talking about years of experience myself and my senior partner have, and we go to 80 to 100 processing plants each a year. We some, see some really good things and we see some really horrible things in those plants. And there's something that we're looking for, all of us, at the end, okay? Remember, there's a lot of different setups that have to be taken into the context of your own operation. Good results can be improved. Minimal results is basically compliance, or what I call status quo. The best way to get the maximized results is eliminate the possibility of loss in all the small areas. You take and you combine all those, and it can be big results. You're only as strong as your weakest link. We're saying that all the way from the hatching eggs all the way into processing. Remember, let's come together. Integrated, not integrated. Basically, these are the macroeconomics of the poultry industry, okay? We start with the egg cost all the way through the processing cost. My bad. To be able to give us a processed, a processed meat cost per kilo. This is an old study done back in 2016 that was done in Brazil. It was a COD 500 bird against a competitor. And what we did was, we got this from, uh, I think it was 14 of, uh, of different companies uh, that were involved in this study. Just three things. This is, this is on here to show you um, down the road here in a few slides you'll understand why I brought this up. What you see here on the wall yield, or the whole bird yield, is almost three quarter of a percent advantage. On the breast yield, on a, it was 0.82, under one percent, and the CV was a 1.8 percent. And remember, we want to come to the plant with a 10 to 12. Where do, how do we get paid, per se? Obviously, starting all the way through with all the live indices rolling into the plant. Who's at the table? This is what I was asking a while ago. Who has responsibility for the plant? In reality, everybody. Because we need to make sure, and, and obviously I, I'm used to integrated systems, okay? Even if not integrated though, you all have to communicate, yes? All the way from the farms to the plants, the breeders, farm, hatchery, feed plant, broilers, transportation, all the way to the abattoir and the, the uh, processing cost. Okay, these are some values that was done in Europe, okay? Now what we're looking at here is, and I have three of these slides, one from Europe, one from the U.S., and one from South America, okay? And this is what we call a point by point. What we're doing here is we're taking the information that we gather from indices inside the plant and in live production and we're making them relative to something that, that everyone in here maybe knows something about. And that's going to be number of hatching eggs. Okay? So what we see is, on the first one, is the 
1%, what is 1% of breast meat cost for, uh, breast meat uh, volume worth? Okay. What we know is to overcome what that 1% of breast meat is worth in, South, uh, in Europe, you have to have, be able to produce at least 37 eggs. 37 more to overcome that if you have a loss. So depending on the amount that you're producing now, and you have an issue in the plant, this is how the plant can drive you down too, okay? Then you see the number that you have to overcome with, okay? So what it is is 1% breast meat basically equals 37 eggs. 1% carcass yield, okay, equals 10 eggs. So let's get more relative to what we know here. The one point feed conversion is worth four and a half eggs, okay? And this is industry studies too, okay? Another one I'd like to note, the 1% CV uniformity is three eggs. Very important. 1% mortality in broilers is three eggs. 1% hatch is worth three eggs to you. One kilo less female feed, two. 1% hatching egg total, 1.8. And then 1% female mor mortality, 1.6. 1 1.3 chicks per one egg. Okay. U.S. This is more of the point by point example. This uses plant and live and brings them all back to each other. Okay. The first one you see there, let's use the one extra day old chick per parent. Okay? Average daily gain, 0.13. Feed conversion, 0.17. Breast meat, which is always going to be a very high costly piece of meat and with a very high value, 0.05. Partial condemn, 0.25 and then the whole legs, 0.14. We'll probably not talk so much about the last two there. This is more in accordance with South America. If you take also a look and look at the extra point at, of ADG, what it is worth on Dale chicks is 7.49 chicks. Feed conversion, one and a quarter points. Breast meat, 0.35. If you look at the feed conversion, day old chicks, six. ADG, 0.8. Feed conversion, I'm sorry, uh, breast meat, 0.28. 1 percent extra breast meat, what is it worth? This is in the U.S., so you're going to see a different number there than you will in uh, South America and uh, than what you will in Europe also. In the U.S., that 1% is worth 21.62. What we see in South America is in the 30s and what we see in Europe also. ADG, 1% breast meat, worth 2.89 points on average daily gain. On feed conversion, 3.6. Okay, that's the basis for that. I won't get into the partial condemn of the whole egg. South America. Same point by point. One extra day old chick to each parent, what is it worth? 1.43 hatching eggs. It was 1.3 in the U.S. Feed conversion, 0.26. Breast meat, 0 0.03. Even lesser value. That tells you that in the U.S. the value of the breast meat is more per pound and or kilo. And on the wall, 0 0.04 is what one extra day old chick is worth. One extra hatching egg per parent on day old chick, 0.7. On 
On fee conversion, point one nine. On breast meat, point zero two, and on the wog, point zero four. One feet conversion point. What is it worth? Day old chick, three point seven eight. On hatching eggs, five point four hatching eggs. On breast meat, point eleven. And on the wall, point two three. One extra breast meat percentage. What is it worth in South America? Thirty over thirty three and a half eggs. It's close to, to Europe. It mimics Europe, but it's ten less than the U.S. On hatching eggs, forty eight hatching eggs. Okay. 8.89 points on feed conversion. That's big. Even if it's South America. That's big. And on the wog, 2.05%. So we have analysts that are able to take your numbers. We don't have a Canadian chart here, okay? So keep that in mind. You can see me later. If you would like to have one set up uh, in your industry, uh, I can get that done for you through the right people, okay? So anyway, that's the basis of this chart. Maximizing yield and performance. Well, increased yield dilutes all the cost. It's all about the pounds. It's all about the dollars. And yield is where the money is. And what we like to say about yield using best practices is that yield is free. Let's talk about how much yield. If you have one bird, if you take a bird in a complex that produces one million a week and it's 2.9 kilos, okay, what is one gram of wog yield worth to you? If you add that one gram back to that, what it ends up happening is at the end of the day and at the end of the year, you have 30,160 kilos a year gain, okay? If you take and if you utilize dollars based on this information here, that is worth $65,000 a year, one gram of wall yield. If you go back to what I was talking about earlier, and you take that 20 gram advantage that we saw in the uh, uh, Brazilian study, then that number that is 65,000 there becomes right over 1.3 million annualized. Okay, so what if we use breast meat? This is the eye meat in a bird under the wing. If you debone by hand, this is what we try to capture. It's about six grams per bird. If you capture that in a process that runs 200,000 birds, you capture that one, just say one gram, okay? What ends up happening is it annualizes one gram of breast meat at this $2.07 per uh, kilo cost or price. You get $107,000 worth advantage. If you take and you add the 23 gram advantage that we've seen in the trial, then that number becomes just under $2.5 million a year. So it all starts with live production. We talk about bird health, poor flock uniformity. One thing to always remember is when we talk about the live production as it comes to the plant, there's nothing that the plant can do to change what it gets. Okay? When we talk about uniformity, one of the issues that we discuss the most is the smaller birds here. We have problems processing them through the stunning, through the scalding, through the killing, the picking. Every process you have a loss. Even in evisceration, automatic equipment will tell those, tear those birds. Birds in the pickers will actually be picked out of the pickers and into the drain. So it's a loss. Expectations, what we talked about earlier on birds, the CV range. We won't come into the uh, plant. We want that 8 to 12. We harp on that 8 to 12 constantly.
these are some of the issues that from the time you catch the birds all the way into the plant, there's nothing you can do to change these. You have culls, you have the small birds that, that will not fit into any program, and typically should be taken out, euthanized correctly, and disposed of on the farm. We see we have leg issues here, some synovitis, you will when I turn it, synovitis and some other issues. Podo, skin conditions, dermatitis, cellulitis. These are all things that the plant and the catch operation to the plant, there's nothing they can do to fix it. What we have here, basically we're talking about making sure that we keep the birds comfortable when they come to the plant, okay? It's very important, and the reason why that's, I say that is we want fans, we want either a larage or a fan operation that tries to have 100% fan coverage of that trailer, okay? Whether it be forced air, uh, a recirculating type system, or straight one-way blowing. The main thing to remember is we're not trying to raise those birds here in this holding sheds. We don't want that. We're here just to keep them alive. We want them run as soon as you get them to the plant. So logistics, logistics, logistics is the key. Do a good eight to 12 hour feed withdrawal program from raise up to the blade, take them to the plant, let's slaughter them, okay? Let's don't let them die there. We have a lot of loss in DOAs because of that. Let's talk about some meat quality issues. Green mussel, this is in relation back to, to the farm, okay? Uh, what we like to call this is a, a, an activity myopathy. We have birds that uh, could be left off feed, water, uh, walking the birds, being too rough with them, getting them up, your serviceman lighting them up. Um, basically, it's all, it's all about uh, uh, the lack of exercise. If you can keep down on the stress and the exercise that bird has of the wings, then you can keep green muscle away. The thing about it is though, what you've got to remember is, it's just like any other muscle. If you work it, it gets bigger. If you activate that bird to make them flap wildly, then what happens is that muscle will expand. It goes against the cavity of the, uh, not the cavity, but the uh, breastplate on that bird and it can expand. So what happens is, basically through the blood pressure and all, it loses um, uh, the blood and it will actually die. So that's where we see the green muscle. DFD and PSE, dark, firm, and dry, is typically associated with long-term stress. PSE is uh, short-term stress. Basically, it's just a quick loss of glycolysis where the pH declines fast in the meat. The way to battle that, when you get the birds to plant, get them in the process, get them chilled. Biggest issue at the plant seems to be bruises. Where they come from, that's the biggest question. We see these in bruises. This is kind of a color chart. To me, there is no perfect color chart for bruises, okay? But, but this is the best we could come up with. Two minutes to red, all the way to in, up to 120 hours where the bird can actually come back to a normal color. This is what we're looking for. We're looking, well, I consider this the perfect breast frame. The breast meat on there is not over scalded from any scalding. All the collagen and membrane is left. The fat is there. It hasn't been rendered by the scalding. So what this gives you is the perfect opportunity to have good quality. It gives you the perfect opportunity to have good shelf life. And those are two of the major things that we're looking for. Thank you. Any questions? Sorry, it's such a rush. <laughs> it's just too much for what time we had. Question, Monsieur Castro. Oui. 
Não. Qualquer. Pode questionar.